Well, hello, Saddleback. It's good to see you all this weekend, and uh, this is the first official uh, weekend of fall, and we're getting ready to begin a brand new major series that I've been waiting to do really all year. I'm very excited about this series. Decade of Destiny is a three-year emphasis of our church family. And during Decade of Destiny, we have about a dozen major initiatives that we're doing uh, together as a church family. One of those major initiatives, one of the 12 in Decade of Destiny, is what we're calling the Healthy uh, Life or Get Healthy Initiative. It is, uh, it's an initiative on the balanced life. And during the Healthy Life Initiative, over the next three years, we're looking at seven key areas of your life that you need to get healthy in, that you need to get fit in, that you need to get strong in, so your life is balanced, less stressful, and, and uh, more peaceful. Now, the seven key areas are we're going to look at uh, physical health, we're looking at spiritual health, we're going to do a module on emotional health, we're going to do one on relational and family health, we're going to do one on mental health, we're going to do a series on uh, vocational health, your career, uh, one on financial health. We're doing seven different key areas of life over the next three years. Now we decided to start with the physical because if you're out of energy, you don't uh, have any, uh, any strength to, to do all the other changes in your life. And so you remember at the beginning of this year, we started with a series on physical health and we launched what was the Daniel Plan. Over 12,000 of you have signed up for that and you actually are looking better and better every week. I'm gonna tell you, I, I don't wanna say that our church is shrinking, but it is, uh, because we've lost about a quarter of a million pounds. In fact, uh, if you're doing the Daniel plan, uh, uh, sometime during a boring part of this sermon, pull out a, a, uh, a little card and write down a progress report for me, okay? We wanna add up all of the pounds lost, and if you have been a part of this, you've lost some, and actually let us know, because we're actually gonna make a, a video, and we're gonna do some before and after pictures, kinda like the Jenny Craig you know, shot, before and after, and you know, before I was a hunk of burning love. Now I'm a tinier hunk of burning love. Anyway, uh, so we're, we, we've done physical. Now this fall, we're going to go into the second module beginning this weekend with a major series on financial health. And I'm really excited about this for a couple of reasons. First, we're going to study two of my favorite books of the Bible, the book of Proverbs and the book of Ecclesiastes. They're in the Old Testament written by Solomon, the wisest man who ever lived. And I love these books. And they are literally filled, chock filled with advice on how to get out of debt, how to stay out of debt, how to prosper, how to have financial stability, how to save, spend, invest, not waste your money, make the most of it, how to have money work for you and not you work for money, and a lot of principles. We're gonna be looking at the laws, the financial laws that are in the Bible in God's word. And there are 20, 30 of these we're gonna look at during this, this series. The other reason why I'm excited about it is because I know we need it right now. Uh, we are now three years into uh, a major recession. Um, there are more people out of work right now than it ever in our lifetime. There are more people under the, the poverty level in America than ever in our lifetime. More people are classified as legitimately poor right now than ever before. There are more people right now with their home upside down. In other words, they owe more on it than it's worth uh, than ever before. And we have 11% of our church family is out of work. And I care about you. And I, I'm praying about this all the time. And, and yet, we voted a year ago as a church to not participate in the recession. <laughs> we said, we're just not going to be a part of that. And we're going to do our own personal recovery program. We're not going to wait on the government for it. And there are principles in God's word that he says, if you do these things, I will bless you. And I'm very, very excited uh, about that. Now, before we look at Proverbs and Ecclesiastes, we start looking at these laws of financial freedom, laws of financial fitness, laws of uh, financial blessing in your life, I want us to look at first at what Jesus said about it. You see, Jesus talked more about money than he did heaven or hell. Did you know that? He talked more about money than heaven or hell. Why? Because we spend more time thinking about money than heaven or hell. We spend much of our time thinking about how to get it, how to make it, 
how to save it, how to spend it, how to invest it, how to protect it, how to uh, you know, uh, you know, insure it, and all the other things. And it, it dominates much of our lives. And so Jesus had a lot to say about money management. He also told us that it, money management is a spiritual discipline, that God is actually watching how I handle my wealth to see what he can trust me with, with true spiritual riches in heaven. Jesus, uh, when he told the parables, you know, the stories, the famous stories of Jesus, over half of the parables Jesus told deal with material possessions. So there's a lot of material in the Bible on how to get out of debt, how to stay out of debt, how to control money instead of having it control you. Now, this weekend, before we begin Proverbs and, and Ecclesiastes, I want us to look at Matthew chapter 25. If you have a Bible, you might want to open to Matthew chapter 25. We're just going to look at the, the story that Jesus told there. If you don't, pull out your message notes and all of the verses we're going to look at are there. This is called the parable of the talents. Now, many people misunderstand this parable because it has the word talent in it. And when we hear the word talent, we think of gifts abilities, uh, you know, your shape, your personality, your spiritual gifts, your heart, the, the things you love to do, what you're naturally good at. The word, the English word talent actually comes from this chapter in the Bible. But before before uh, there was uh, this, Jesus told this story, the word talent didn't exist. But a talent is actually a measurement of money. And while this does have application to your talents, your gifts, your abilities, this is actually a parable, a story about money management. A talent was a specific weight of gold. And there was a Babylonian talent, there was a Greek talent, and there was a Roman talent, which was a specific amount of money. So we're gonna look at it. Now in this uh, chapter, we're gonna start in verse um, 14. We have the story of a, of a rich businessman. And Jesus tells this story of a guy who's very, very wealthy. We can know that by what he gives his uh, uh, servants to take care of. And he says, I'm gonna go away on a trip. And I'm gonna be gone for a long time, so I'm gonna put you in charge of my property. And he divides up his wealth. You know, in those days there weren't any banks. And so you didn't keep your money in a bank. So he's got all of his wealth at home, and he divides his wealth up among his three servants. And he says, I expect you guys to make the most of this. And when I come back, we'll see what happens. And uh, so he's gone for a long time. And later the, the, the businessman comes back home and he says, okay, give me an account. What'd you guys do with my money? And, uh, and uh, they tell the story and two of the guys have a good report. And one of the guys has a bad report. And then Jesus draws some spiritual truths out of this. Out of this story, we learn seven foundations for financial fitness. If you ever needed to take notes, you need to take notes this weekend. Because these are foundations that base uh, the stability of your life on in order to become all God wants you to be. Now let's look at it together. They're on your outline. In Matthew uh, 25 verse 14, we, we see the beginning of the story. And it says this, the kingdom of heaven, Jesus said, will be like a man going on a journey, this businessman. And he called his three servants together and he entrusted his property to them. Now, if you're taking notes, I want you to circle the word his there on that verse. It says, he called his three servants together and entrusted his property to them. So when we're talking about money here, whose money are we talking about? The money owned by the master or the money owned by the, the servants? Yeah, the master. It's not the servant's money, it's the master's money, but he's giving it to them to take care of. This, by the way, is called stewardship. You've heard this word before, uh, a steward or stewardship. That's the old English word for manager. Any of you who are managers or involved in management in a business are actually stewards. A steward is a manager, and stewardship simply means management. We are called to be stewards of our time, manage your time. We are called to be stewards of our influence. We are called to be stewards of our health, of our minds, of our relationships, of our opportunities. Everything you have, you are to be a steward of or a manager of. Now, he says here, he entrusted his property to his servants. Now, this is the first law of financial freedom. 
And it is this, the law of possession is this. You might write this down. Everything I have belongs to God. I need to just settle that one right up front. It's not my money. It all belongs to God. He said, wait a minute, but I worked for this. Where do you think you got your body to work for it? Where do you think you got your mind to work for it? Where do you think you got your energy to work for it? Where do you think you got your intelligence to work? Everything you have is a gift from God. So you don't really own anything in life. It's all on loan. Someday I'm gonna write a book and the first sentence of the book will be, what you think you own is really on loan. You see, I didn't own anything before I was born. I didn't bring anything into the world. I've been there at the birth of all my babies and grandbabies. None of them came in carrying a satchel full of money. Okay, You didn't bring anything into the world and I've been there at the other end too at the funerals. Nobody takes it out with them. You never see a hearse driving a you know, U-Haul with it. Okay. So you only get to use it while you're here. It's God's money. God loaned it to somebody before you. He's loaned it to you for 80 years and he's gonna loan it to somebody else after you die. You don't own it. It's all under management. The master owns it all. God is the owner. Now, this is really important because we tend to forget it. We forget, and, and, and when we forget it, you know what is the sign that you've forgotten that it's God's and, and not yours? When you think it's yours, you worry about it. Worry is the sign that you think it's all yours. Now, let's say you had a beach house and you said, Rick, I'm going to Spain for a year and we're gonna let you and Kay use uh, your, our beach house for a year. So we use your beach house for a year. And then you call up a year later and go, you know what? We think we're gonna stay, we're having a good time, so we're gonna stay another year in Spain. Use our beach house for another year. And so then on the third year, you call up again and say, hey, go ahead and use it for a third year. By this time, I'm starting to think, this is mine. You come home about year four and you say, I'm ready to move back in. I say, what do you mean? You're not moving, this is my house. You know, possession's nine-tenths of the law. It's mine now. And we tend to think because God has loaned it to us for an extended period of time that it's ours. It's not. Now, if you would remind yourself of this first truth every day, you'd worry a whole lot less. Now, in the next verse, verse 15, it says, this master, he, he loans his money out, and he says, to one servant he gave five talents of money, and to another he gave two talents of money, and to another, it says, he gave uh, uh, one talent of money. Okay. Now, what's he talking about here? But, uh, well, a talent, literally, a Roman talent is 71 pounds of gold. Think about that. Now, today, yesterday, gold was $1,600 an ounce. Okay? So that means uh, if you got a talent of gold, you got $1.8 million. This is not a small investment. Okay? If you got two uh, two talents, which he gave to one guy, he's just given you $3.6 million to take care of while he's gone. If he's given you five talents, he's just given you $9 million to take care of. This is not a small amount. He's really trusting, and God has made a huge investment in you. We'll talk about that later. But the first law, the law God possesses everything, it all belongs to him, and then this is the second law, and it says he gives one, five talents to one, two talents to another, and a, one talent of gold to another guy, each according to his ability that he left on his journey. This is the law of allocation, and it is this. God has loaned me money. I just talked about that. You don't really own it. He's loaning it to you for 30, 40, 50, 60, 80, 90, at the most, 100 years. Now you notice, in this story that Jesus tells, everybody gets a different amount. That's obvious. We're not all equally wealthy. We're not all equally, uh, uh, you know, have the same economic status. It says some guy, some guy get one talent, some guy gets two talents, some guy gets five talents of gold. But the point is this, everybody gets something. Now, there are no no talent people in the world. If you're breathing, that is a blessing. If you are alive, that in itself is a blessing. Now, everybody gets something, and they all begin to go out. Now, notice the next verse, verse 16, there on your outline. The man who had received the five talents went at once 
and put his money to work. Circle that phrase, put his money to work. And gained five more talents of gold. And so the one with the two talents also doubled his money. But the man who had received the one talent went off, dug a hole in the ground, and just hid his master's money. Now there's a couple things I want to point out here. And the first is this. Money is a tool to be used. You put it to work. You use money and you love people. Now if you get that reversed, you're going to be in trouble. Because if you start loving money, you will use people. No, people are to be loved, money is to be used. You are to never love money. You are to use it. It is a tool to be used. You say, well, wait a minute, isn't money the root of all evil? Isn't that what the Bible says? No, that's not what the Bible says. The Bible does not say money is the root of all evil. It says the love of money is the root of all evil. Money is totally neutral. It can be used for good or bad. It can be used by Hitler to uh, you know, bomb Europe or it could be used by churches to spread uh, good news and feed the hungry. You can use it on very selfish-centered purposes or you can use it for very unselfish purposes. You can use it to create businesses and products that bless the entire world. Money is a neutral thing. It's neither good nor bad. It's what you do with it. But he says, put your money to work. One of the things we're gonna learn in the next several weeks together is how to put your money to work. The reason why most people are in debt and the reason why most people never get out of debt is because they are always working for their money instead of having their money work for them. You gotta reverse this. This is a whole different way of thinking about money. You gotta learn how to put your money to work for you instead of you working for money. If you work for money, you will always be needing more. You will always be in debt. But if you learn how to make money work for you, then money becomes your servant. Money is a wonderful servant. It is a terrible master. It is a terrible master. And you know it's a master when it's causing stress in your life. Then it's mastering you. It's controlling you. Now, he says, he gives the money out to these three servants. One goes out and invests it, puts it to work. Another goes out and puts it to work. Third guy goes and hides it in the ground. Here's the point. You get to choose what you do with what God gives you. You don't get to choose what you're given. Some people are given one talent. Some people are given five talents. Some people are given 10 talents. Some people are given two talents. That's just different amounts. Okay. But you do get to choose what you do with it. And what you do with it is what God is watching. Now when you get to heaven one day, God is not gonna say, why weren't you more like your brother? Why weren't you more like your dad? Why weren't you more like your mother? Why weren't you more, no, you are only responsible for the talents you've been given. And I'm talking about not just money, but your time and your abilities and all these other different things. When you get to heaven, God is never gonna compare you to anybody else. He's not, you, and you can't say, well, look, you only gave me one talent. You gave that guy five talents. God isn't going to say, who, who are you talking about? God wants to know, what did you do with what you were given? What did you do with what you were given? Not what I gave somebody else, but what I gave you. So God says, you get to choose what you do with the money I give you. Now, what can you do with that money? You can waste it, and there are plenty of ways to waste it. You can spend it, you can use it, you can invest it. You know, they're all different kinds, you could hoard it. There are lots of ways, and God lets you choose which way you wanna do it, but you will have to give an account one day for the reasons you chose to do what you did with the money he loaned to you while you were alive. This is a test. One day, you're gonna to have to explain it. And that's why in verse 19 it says, after a long time, the master of the three servants returned to settle his accounts. Circle the word accounts. He said he returned to settle his accounts. This is the next law, the third law. And the third law is the law of accountability. And the law of accountability is this. One day, God will audit me. 
One day God is going to audit me. He's going to come and settle accounts. There's going to be a final exam on the life God gave you. It will be a life audit, not by the IRS, but by the G-O-D. And the difference with the, between the IRS and the G-O-D is God has all the records. You don't have to bring any to that audit. He's already got it. He's seen everything you've ever done with your time, with your words, with your money, with your life. The times you used it for good and the times you just flat out blew it. But you will give an account one day. And it is foolish to go through life thinking that I'm not going to have an audit at the end of life. You think God would create you, put you on this planet, and then at the end say, now what'd you do with your life? I put you, I created you, and I made you for a reason. And so there's going to be this, this audit. God has made an investment in you. He has given you certain gifts, certain abilities, certain opportunities. He's given you certain resources. He's given you a certain heritage. He's given you certain freedoms. He's given you a certain amount of intellect and intelligence and energy. And God's going, what'd you do with all that stuff? Well, I made a lot of money, retired and died. Ah, wrong answer. You think I put you on earth to live for yourself? I mean, come on. I mean, really, come on. You think I put you on earth to live simply for yourself? And to stockpile a bunch of things that you're not going to take with you anyway when you die? Life is not in the acquisition of things. You've seen that bumper sticker, he who dies with the most toys wins. No, the sticker should say, he who dies with the most toys still dies. <laughs> and he wasted his life because life is not about the acquisition of things because you're not taking any of it with you. It all belongs to God. And God has loaned it to me. He's watching what I do with it. And one day I'm going to give an account of how well I used the money, the resources, the time, the energy, all things that God gave me. The Bible says this here on the screen, Romans 14, 12. Each of us will give an account of himself to God. Now, you know, it's fun to be irresponsible. But you can't be irresponsible your entire life. My guess is that when you got out of high school, you either A, went off and tried to get a job, or you went off to college. And either way, whether you went to college or went to work, there's probably a few years in there you were just slacking around. You think, I'm out of the house, I'm going to have some fun. And you're kind of, you know, irresponsible. You sleep in, you don't really try to get a job, you're watching cartoons, eating Cocoa Puffs, you know, and playing video games and, and, and things like that. But at some point, you have to wake up and go, <clears throat> excuse me, I got to get a life. I, I cannot be irresponsible my entire life. It might work for a year or two. But the master's going to come back and I'm going to give an account. And irresponsibility never lasts. It always catches you in the end. And that's what happens to people when they get in debt. We are financially irresponsible and it eventually catches up with us. And the chickens come home to roost. Right now, America is reeling in the results of decades of overspending. And how the most blessed and most prosperous and the most... A uh, wealthy nation in the world can be on the verge of bankruptcy isn't amazing, but it can happen. All you have to do is just spend trillions and trillions and trillions of dollars and keep spending it. You cannot be irresponsible forever. At some point, you have to kind of man up. Now, the law of accountability says that one day God's going to say, what would you do with what I gave you? Now, notice these three guys have three different responses. The first guy uh, he's got a good report. He's got a good ROI, a return on his investment. And in verse 21, 20 and 21, it says, uh, the man who had received five talents, okay, uh, brought the other, so remember this is about nine million bucks, brought the other uh, five he had made. And uh, master, he said, you entrusted me with five talents. See, I've gained five more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. Well, I guess so. He's got 100% return. I'd be happy for a tenth of that today, wouldn't you? I mean, 100% I mean, return, he doubled his investment. I mean, this guy bought Google. You know? okay. He clearly, he got in on the front end of Amazon or something and his stock has really soared. He doubles investment, 100% return. Same thing with the second guy. 
Second guy has another good return and a good report to, to share. Verse 22, that servant who was given two talents of money also came and said, Master, you entrusted me with two talents. Now, see, I have gained two more. He's doubled his. And his master replies to him, well done, good and faithful servant. 100% return on investment. Now the third guy does not have a good story to tell because he has not used what God gave him wisely. And he doesn't have a good report in verse 24. Then the man who had received the one talent came and said, uh, master, I knew that you are a hard man. Now notice he's turning the tables. He's trying to put the blame on his boss. Master, I knew that you are a hard man, harvesting where you have not sown and gathering where you haven't scattered seed. So I was afraid. Uh, you know, I was afraid of losing your money. And I went out and I hid your talent in the ground. I buried it. I just buried it. Now, here it is. Here's what belongs to you. Nothing ventured, nothing gained. And what is the master's reply to the servant? You wicked lazy servant. Now let's just tear this apart a minute because this story's in the Bible for a reason. This guy buries what God has given him. He does nothing with it. He doesn't use his talent. And then he blames his master for his own mismanagement and for his failure. He says, I'm a victim. We've got people doing this today. They mess up their lives and uh, you know, they, 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 they mess up their lives and they, they don't know what to do. So they blame the government, or they blame the boss, or they blame their parents, and they blame everybody else. God didn't cause you to put all that money, on all those expenses on your credit card. God didn't tell you to go buy a brand new car when you couldn't afford it. God didn't tell you to go buy a house that you couldn't afford. The Bible says this here on the, on the screen, Proverbs 19, three, people ruin themselves by their own stupid actions and then blame the Lord. You've heard me say this before. Anytime I blame, you spell blame, be lame. And every time I blame you for my problems, I am being lame. Now notice the master's response to this guy's whining. He says, verse 27, he said, you know, you should have at least put my money in the bank so I could make some interest. I mean, just put it in a passbook account. It's not making anything, but that's better than digging a hole in the ground and just burying it. You could have at least made some, some money on it. Now this leads us to the fourth law of financial freedom, and it is the law of utilization. And the, the law of utilization is this, I must wisely use God's money. God expects me to use what I've got, not to hoard it, not to sit on it, not to hide it, not to bury it, not to deny it, but money is a tool and it is meant to be used. It is not meant to be stockpiled. Money is like manure, okay? If you spread it all around, it helps things grow, like fertilizer. But if you pile it up, it just starts stinking. And money is like fertilizer, you know? You, you don't pile it up. He says money is to be used. Now God expects me to invest what he loans me. Now this third guy, what's the problem with him? He's cautious. He's conservative. They said nothing ventured, nothing gained. And what's he do? He just sits on it. And, he, and what, he takes what his master has given him and doesn't do anything with it. And does this upset the master? Are you kidding? The master says, you wicked, lazy servant. Doesn't that seem a little strong to you? Okay. He said I was afraid of losing it, so I didn't do anything with it. And God says to him, or the master says to him, you're wicked. Now that's not a word we would usually use for money management, mismanagement. But what he's saying here is this. This is a serious sin. See, when we think of the word wicked, we think of rape. We think of murder. When I think of wicked, I think of child abuse. I think of sex trafficking. I think of forced slavery and bondage. I think of those things as wickedness. But you know what God says? He's saying, Rick, it's wicked anytime you misuse or abuse the resources I gave you. And you don't use them wisely. That's wicked. This is a test. I put you on earth to see if I could trust you. 
And if I, I can't trust you in heaven with greater responsibility, if I can't trust you on earth with some serious money management issues. He said, doing nothing is inexcusable. Now that's true with everything. Doing nothing with your talent. You just sit on it and you don't use your talent. Doing nothing with your money. You just sit on it and you don't use it. Doing nothing with your time. You just sit on it and you use it instead of using it. You don't invest it. The greatest use of your life is to invest it in that which will outlast it. He says, man, at least you should have put it in the bank. You didn't even try. You didn't even make any effort. You've done nothing. He said, what did you do with it? He goes, well, I buried it. What do we do when we bury something? We bury things to forget them. He says, I don't want to think about this. I don't want to face it. I don't want to deal with the responsibility. Money is too big of a responsibility, so I don't even want to, I just not even think about it. And that's why how a lot of people get deeply in debt, they don't want to think about it. I know I'm not making it, and I know I'm going deeper and deeper in debt every month, so I just won't think about it. I'll just pretend it doesn't exist. I'll bury it. I'll bury my financial problems and just ignore the fact that my credit card is getting bigger and bigger and bigger every month. Now friends, easy credit plus ignorance and being in the dark about your finances is guaranteed disaster. And one of the points we're gonna look at, one of the laws is knowing where your money's coming from, knowing where it's going, knowing where you got it, and knowing what you're doing with it. Now, what is he saying here in this story? Why does he tell us this story? Because he's saying you can't please God with your life by doing nothing. You say, Rick, are you telling me that I could do nothing and that would be wicked? Yes, because God did not put you on earth to do nothing. He put you on here on earth to use your time, your money, your energy, your intelligence, your personality, and all those things for good and for God to get to know God, to get to know others, to love others, to love God. Doing nothing with what God has given me is inexcusable. In fact, God would rather have you try and invest your life in something and have it totally fail than do nothing and succeed. Because God wants you to learn to live by faith. Now, before we move off of this point, let me ask you this question. Notice, which of the three people the five talent person, the two talent person, or the one talent person is most likely to bury his talent. The one talent. Why? Because when I only have one talent, I look out and I go, look at all these five talent people. They don't need me. I'll just sit on the bench and watch. Because I'm not a superstar, I won't do anything. Well, because you may not be a superstar does not excuse you to do nothing with your life. You say, well, I don't have the brains she does. I don't have the looks he has. I don't have the background he has. I didn't have the head start with the family that guy did. I didn't become a Christian until later in life. Not, you can give me a thousand excuses. You say, no, 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 that's not it. Remember, not, God's not gonna judge you and evaluate you and audit you according to anybody else. He's gonna say, hey, when you finally got the picture, what'd you start doing with it? When it finally, the light clicked on and it dawned on you that I'm here for more than just me, did you ever actually do anything about it? If you didn't develop that talent, he says, that's not good. The one talent person says, since I'm not a super, superstar, I'll just sit here. But just because you can't be the best doesn't mean you, you can do nothing. Now, the reason I'm belaboring this point is because some of you have lost your joy. And you're really just kind of going through life, going through the motions. Same place, same thing. Ta-dum, 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 ta-dum. And there's no joy in your life. There's no energy in your life. There's no enthusiasm in your life. You're just kind of putting in the hours and punching the clock and hoping for the weekend. You are missing the life God intended for you to have. God meant for you to do more than just punch a time clock or to go through life little by little. No spark, no enthusiasm. The reason why you have no spark, no enthusiasm, you are playing it safe. You're burying your talents in the ground. I don't know what they are. Maybe you don't even know what they are. Well, that's why we have a class called Class 301 to help you discover all the different talents in your life, your shape, your abilities, who God made you to be. But if you're living for yourself and you're not using your talents for God's purpose, you're not gonna be joyful, you're not gonna be happy. Now, why do we do this? God comes along and said, I mean, it wasn't like the one talent was, was nothing. It was $1.8 million. And you buried it? 
He buried it? You gotta be kidding me. So what does that mean? Why do we do that? Why do we hide talents? We don't let other people know about it. And why don't we, why, you know, why don't we do what really go out on a limb with God and trust him in faith? I'll tell you why, it's one reason. F-E-A-R, it's fear. And that brings us to the next law. The fifth law of financial freedom and financial fitness is the law of motivation. And it is this, if I'm gonna be successful in life, here it is, I must move against my fears. I must move against my fears. I have to do the very thing I fear the most. Because with every talent, there is a corresponding fear to keep you from using that talent. If you have a talent at singing, there will be a fear that nobody will like it. If you have a talent at business, there will be a fear that, what if I fail? And if you have a t fear, uh, uh, talent in any other area, there will always be the what ifs in the back that keep you from stepping out and doing what God created you to do with your life. Investing your life. What keeps us from investing our lives? What keeps us from in moving to financial freedom? Well, I'll tell you what it is. It is fear. You see, in this book, there are principles that God guarantees, not me, God guarantees that if you do these financial principles, you will be blessed. The problem is, some of them are counterculture, and it's the exact opposite of what you feel like doing. And so then God says, we're gonna make this a test. Do you trust me or do you trust yourself? And the reason why a lot of people never get out of debt is because they are unwilling to trust God in the steps to getting out of debt. They are afraid to do what the Bible says to do. And because they're afraid to do what the Bible says to do, they just go year to year to year to year, constantly in debt, living from hand to, hand to mouth, barely getting by, overspending, and being overstressed. Now God promises that if I follow the commands, and we're gonna look at these in the book of Proverbs and Ecclesiastes starting next week, the, the laws of financial stability. God says, if I do these, I will find blessing and benefit in my life, but they require faith. And that means I'm gonna have the fears coming in going, I'm afraid to do what God tells me to do. Now this happens in lots of areas. People get afraid of doing it God's way. I'm afraid that if I don't sleep around, I'll never get married. I'm afraid I'll never get out of debt if I do the eight or 10, 12, 20 principles that God says to do. And God says, these fears will hold you back. He says, I was afraid. I was afraid. I was afraid. And I hid your money in the ground. Now we're getting to the real issue. Now there are multiple kinds of fears that can hold you back. There's self-doubt, I could never do that. You've always had a dream of starting a business. I could never do that, I'm not qualified. There's the feel of failure. How many of you when you were in school had uh, the fear that caused you to hesitate raising your hand? Yeah, you still have it. <laughs> There's the fear of self-doubt. There's the fear of self-consciousness. What will other people think? The Bible says the fear of man is a trap. If you worry about what other people think about your life, you will never be a success. You gotta not worry about what other people think. And then there's the fear of self-pity. And you just say, oh, you know, I, I failed in the past, so I'm never gonna try again. Well, that's kinda dumb. Just because you fail doesn't mean you give up. Everybody fails. That's the only way you learn what works. Don't call it a failure, call it an experiment. Call it an education. And if failure is an education, many of us are quite educated. <laughs> we know what doesn't work. We go, okay, we'll, we'll, we'll do that, okay? But God uses ordinary people who just keep on going. You know, one of my favorite stories is the way two of the disciples handled failure. You know, there were two guys who followed Jesus in the 12 who denied Jesus at the cross. There were two of them. Judas denied Jesus and Peter denied Jesus. They both committed the exact same sin. No one was more worse than the other. They both denied their savior, Jesus Christ. What made the difference was the way they reacted to their failure. Judas 
had a pity party, went out, got depressed, and took his life. He hung himself, he committed suicide. Peter realized what he'd done was wrong. He went to, to God, he prayed, he asked forgiveness, he repented, and Peter, the guy, the biggest failure among the 12 was the guy Jesus cho chooses that 40 days later after the resurrection, he says, that's the guy I want to preach on Pentecost and starts the church and 3,000 people are saved the first day. And Jesus looks at Peter and says, upon this rock, on your faith, I will build the church. He chose the biggest failure in the bunch to build the church on. I like that. What a God. He didn't choose a superstar. He chose the, guy, chose the guy who had blown it the most. And so you start saying, well, you know, I'm having this pity party. I, I really messed up financially in the past. Yeah, okay. Doesn't matter where, direct, where you've been. What matters is the direction your feet are right now. Now, you're not going to get out of debt overnight. You didn't get in debt overnight. One of the principles we're going to look at in the next few weeks is called the little by little principle. It's kind of like losing weight. You know, I stood up in January and said, you guys, I need to lose a bunch of weight. I've lost about 45 now, but look, it's taken me, what, eight, nine months. I'm not through, and I'm going to keep on, but it's little by little. Why? I didn't gain it overnight. You're not going to go lose, you know, 80 pounds in a week. You didn't gain it now, and, and you didn't get in debt overnight. You're not going to get out of debt. I, I can tell you, if you'll stick with me in the next five weeks, I can tell you how to get out of debt. In fact, one of the things I'm going to do is I'm going to share my financial testimony. Because what I'm going to share with you is not only what's in the Word of God, but how I started practicing it at age 17. And that's why for the last nine years, I haven't taken a salary from Saddleback Church. I didn't need to. Why? Because when I was 17, I started practicing the 10, 10, 80 principle. And I started putting away, when I was 17, I started putting away 50 cents a week toward my retirement at 17. That's called the power of compounding interest. It is the most powerful influence in the world. The power of compounding interest, Albert, I mean Einstein said, is the most powerful factor in the world. It is geometric and exponential. And if you start little by little, it expands and expands and expands. But you got to do it God's way. What does that mean? It means you're thinking more long-term than short-term. It means you're thinking about the future, not here and now. We're going to talk about the legacy of leaving a legacy to children and leaving a legacy to grandchildren. And how do you do that? But you've got to do it God's way. And, and so fear is always attached to this desire to do God's way and Satan's going to try to get you to not do it. Now, this guy didn't move against his fear. And so we come to the next principle. And the next principle, we find, look at verse 28. The master says this, okay? This guy didn't use what I gave him, the little bit I gave him. Take away the money from this servant who had one talent and give it to the one with 10 talents. You gotta be kidding me, you're gonna give the guy who's got a lot more? Yep. To those who use well what they are given, even more will be given, and they will have an abundance. But for those who are unfaithful, even what little they have will be taken away. This is the law of application, and here it is. If I don't use it, I lose it. That is a principle of the universe that you cannot deny. If you don't use it, you will lose it. And if you're not using what you got, you don't get what you've got. And God has the right to take away anything that I don't use to invest for him. Because it's all his in the first place. Now this is a, a universal law. If I don't lose it, use it, I lose it. If I refuse to exercise, I lose muscle. If I refuse to think, my mind goes dull. If I refuse to practice, I lose that ability in sports or music or any other area. I lose that talent. If you don't use it, you lose it. On the other hand, the flip side is the good side, and that is this. If I do use it wisely, God gives me more. I am exhibit A 
of this principle. That if you use it wisely, God gives you more. You know, people say, well, you know, Rick, you, know, you wrote a best-selling, the best-selling book in American history, and so it brought in you know, millions and millions of dollars. Well, yeah, I'd give away millions of dollars if I had millions. No, 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 I had a 35-year track record before that. Do you know why God let me write Purpose Driven Life? Because he could trust me with the money. It's not because I'm the best author, because I'm not. I'm not, but I had a 35-year track record of being faithful to God when I was making $200 a week and $100 a week and $300 a week. And I was faithful in the 10, 10, 80 and I was faithful in the principles of Proverbs and I was faithful in saving and in spending and in giving and in investing and all of those things. And God said, you know what? I can trust that guy. Can God trust you? Could God trust you like that? Could God just shower you with, say, 30, 40 million dollars, knowing that you would not be blown away by it and that you'd use it the way he wanted it, not the way you would want to use it? Whatever you need more of, you give it to God. If you need more time, you give God your time. If you need more energy, you give God your energy. If you need more brains, you give God your brain. If you need more money, you give God your money. That's what he blesses. Whatever you sow, you will reap. And we'll look at that. One of the laws is the law of the harvest. Now, when you sow a seed, you don't get one seed back. You always get exponentially, geometrically more. If I sow one kernel of corn, plant it in my backyard, I don't get one kernel of corn back. I get a stalk of corns with hundreds of corns on it. I always get back more than I sow. That is the law of sowing and harvest. Now, there's one more law. The law of compensation. And the law of compensation is this. God will reward me for good money, money management. God will reward me for good money management. Money is the acid test of your faithfulness. God uses it more than any other thing in your life to test your faith. Why? It's because it's the thing we have the hardest time with. Now, look at the rewards that God gives for wise money management. In verse 21, he says this. The master replied to the guys who had used their money well. He said, uh, well done. That's the first thing. Well done, good and faithful servant. That's the first reward. He says, you've been faithful with few things. I will now put you in charge of many things. That's the second reward. Come and share your master's happiness. That's the third reward. If you want to write this down, it's three words. Affirmation, promotion, celebration. Affirmation, promotion, celebration. First, he says, the first reward is affirmation. God says to you, well done, good and faithful servant. Good job. That's my boy. That's my girl. You passed the test. I, I was testing you to see what you would do. Could you be trusted with what I gave you? And you pass the test, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of more. That's the second, promotion. First affirmation, good job. Promotion, greater responsibility. Did you know that what you do in heaven, your job, your responsibilities, your roles, your rewards are gonna be determined by how you use what you were given here? This is the test, this is the test. And then celebration, come and share God's happiness. Says, Come on in, it's party time in Dana Point. Come on down, we're gonna have a party. Money is the acid test of how much you trust God. That's why we're gonna spend some weeks on this. Not just to get you out of debt, because I want you to learn to trust God more. Here's what Jesus said, look here on the screen. If you are untrustworthy, with worldly wealth. That means if you don't manage your money here on earth, you don't manage it well, you're always in debt, you don't ever have any able to give away to share with anybody else because your own needs aren't met. If you're untrustworthy with worldly wealth, who will trust you with the true riches of heaven? He said, if I can't trust you with real money here on earth, how can I trust you with heavenly money, the true riches in heaven? And if you're not faithful with other people's money, why should you be trusted with money of your own? This is Jesus talking. No one can serve two masters. 
For you either hate the one and love the other, or be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Now notice he doesn't say there you should not serve God and money. He says you can't. It's impossible. Nobody can serve two masters. So you're going to have to decide what's going to be number one in my life, God or making money. You can only have one number one in your life. Whatever's number one in your life is your God. Whatever's number one in your life is what you love. The Bible says you cannot serve God and money. As I said earlier, money is a terrific servant. It is a terrible master. When it masters you, you're always under stress. It's always controlling you. You're always worried. You're always uptight about it. When you are the master of your money, when it is your servant, it serves you. When money works for you instead of you working for your money, then you have peace. Now let me just close by asking this question. If God did an audit of your life right now on your finances, what grade would he give you? A, B, C, whatever it is, my goal is to move you up the scale in the next couple weeks. Because this issue is an eternal issue. If you are not faithful in unrighteous mammon, money management, who will trust you the true riches of heaven? I want you to have the good roles, the good responsibilities, the good rewards in heaven. And as your pastor, I'm praying that you'll learn these principles and apply them, not just so you get out of debt. I want you out of debt. I want you to succeed. I want you to prosper. But more than that, I want you to be what God wants you to be. Let's bow our heads. Would you pray this prayer in your heart? Dear God, I realize that everything I have belongs to you. Nothing is really mine. You just loaned it to me. I realize that everything I have is a gift from you and it comes from you. And one day it will all return to you. And I realize, Lord, that one day you're going to do an audit on my life and you're going to ask me to give an account of what I did with what I was given. I want to practice these principles. I want to wisely use your money. I want to learn the principles of financial fitness. And then I want to move against my fears and do the right thing whether I feel like it or not. Lord, I didn't get in the mess I'm in overnight, but I want to learn the little by little principle and as we talk about these areas of freedom in Decade of Destiny, I want to not just be spiritually free and emotionally free and relationally free, but I want to be financially free. I realize that if I don't use it, I'll lose it. But I also realize that if I use it wisely, that you have promised to reward me for good management. And with their heads still bowed, an unmanaged finances are simply a symptom of an unmanaged life. And what you need is a life manager. And his name is Jesus Christ. That's what it means to make Jesus the Lord of your life. It means to put him under new management, to put your life under new management. Jesus Christ, become the manager of my life. Say that. Jesus Christ, I want you to be the manager of my life from this day forward. I want to follow your will and your way. In your name I pray, amen.